Welcome to Unrestrained, the podcast series from CPI. Here you can enjoy conversations with professionals on all sides of crisis and behavior management, relax and open up about themselves, their workplace, and their clients. You'll get the latest tips and trends from the best in the business, so tune in often to integrate their experiences with your own. Hello and welcome to Unrestrained, the CPI podcast series. This is your host, Terry Vitone. And today I'm joined by Don Costa, a lieutenant and manager of the Protective Services Department of the Yale New Haven Hospital, and Dave Vargas, elite global professional instructor for CPI. Hello and welcome, Don and Dave. Hi. How are you doing, Terry? Good, good. Dave. Hi, Terry. Uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for asking us to be here. You're welcome, Dave. Let me begin by telling you a little bit about our guests. Donald Costa has over 35 years of experience in both the public and private sectors of law enforcement. He was initially trained in as a law enforcement specialist in the United States Air Force. After military service, Don pursued a career in law enforcement, serving on the city of Waterbury Police Department as a patrolman in a high-crime area, as well as a detective who earned several commendations for bravery and valor. Since retiring from the public sector, Don has worked in the healthcare sector and is now the manager of protective services for one of the largest healthcare facilities in the country. Don is currently a master level CPI instructor, training some 2,000 hospital staff annually in nonviolent crisis intervention. Don also developed and instituted a safety awareness program that has effectively reduced the application of physical restraints used at the hospital, resulting in a reduction of staff injuries. Don also planned and implemented the Critical Incident Stress Management Team, which responds to extraordinary events within the campus as well as the surrounding community. Also joining the podcast, podcast is Dave Vargas, a lead global professional instructor with CPI. Dave is originally from Watoma, Wisconsin, and holds a bachelor's degree in communication from St. Norbert College. Dave has nearly 16 years of experience in the fields of security and law enforcement and maintains an active certification as a law enforcement officer in the state of Wisconsin. In addition to his responsibilities with CPI, Dave is a patrol sergeant with the Village of Hancock Police Department. In Dave's words, I enjoy training with CPI because our program prepares staff to effectively respond to real-life situations and to provide good service to individuals in our care, even during their most vulnerable and violent moments. From my perspective as a police officer, I've experienced firsthand how untrained or undertrained staff can perpetuate crises based on how they respond. My hope is that through CPI training, staff will be better prepared and more likely to handle behavioral outbursts in-house thus freeing up law enforcement to respond to other calls for service in the community, some that may be life-threatening. All right, so then to start today, Don, could you talk about your career in the United States Air Force and in law enforcement leading up to your position as a lieutenant at the Yale New Haven Protective Services Department in the hospital there? Sure, sure, Terry. Uh, Well, I grew up in a family that uh, was a military family, and part of the family were policemen since the early 1900s, so, and the other part was mostly mostly in healthcare, so it was a perfect fit for me to go into law enforcement. Uh, when I decided to go into the Air Force, I knew that the Air Force had a uh, law enforcement specialist program, which, uh, field, which was similar to uh, a town police department, so I wanted to pursue that, and I was grateful. I went to their academy and uh, learned quite a bit and got my feet wet in the law enforcement community. Uh, so when I got out, I I just I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to go into the city department, and that was my desire. And uh, I was fortunate. I tested well, and I was able to get on to the city of Waterbury's police department. Uh, Waterbury's about 120,000 people, and 350 police officers. At one time, it was considered the brass city of the United States. Uh, over the years, uh, industry has moved out, and uh, there's been a situation where the city's a little bit depressed, and that's resulted in some high crime rate. Uh, at one point in the the I'll call it the crack cocaine uh, wars in the mid 80s and early 90s. Uh, my my partner was uh, shot and killed by a, a, a drug dealer who is currently serving a, a life sentence in Connecticut institution. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, 
And then in uh, 1997, I was on a surveillance with another detective when we just happened to be uh, maybe in the right place, maybe in the wrong place, but there was a drive-by shooting right in front of us. Uh, that was uh, the vehicle was occupied by four individuals wanted for homicide out of New Jersey. Uh, during our course of our interaction, I shot one of the individuals. Uh, so I've, I've experienced a, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, stress on the job. So uh, you are a case-hardened detective, no doubt. Yeah, the, so life went on, and I, I tested, and I uh, the second part of my career in Waterbury, I was uh, promoted to a civil service as two detectives. Mm-hmm. Um, as things uh, went forward, uh, the city, which is, is very depressed, uh, had uh, some financial issues, so we all, all of us had had the time. Uh, we retired. Uh, actually, it was uh, 150 of us that retired at once uh, so we could get our benefits, but uh, I, I was fortunate to be able to segue into the health care and I knew that Yale New Haven Hospital, actually, in 1969, it had its own police department and uh, were considered constables from the uh, city of New Haven. Uh, so I had heard that they were actually going to be hiring, and the idea was they were going to only hire post-certified. And post-certified is uh, post-meaning police officer standards test. Uh, and training, which is a national uh, certification and standard for police officers throughout the country. So they wanted a unique type of uh, security system at Yale. So they were hiring. They wanted experience. They wanted all post-certified officers uh, that have also worked in some active certified police departments. We are all so armed. Deeply qualified staff. Yes, uh, we have some some of the officers here are uh, retired uh, police chiefs, uh, ranking detectives, ranking patrolmen, lieutenants, captains. Uh, uh, this is and Yale is considered a uh, a coveted post, so uh, in position. So I felt very fortunate to to arrive at Yale, and I did it at, at a very important time. I've been here 10 years, and when I first arrived, uh, there was maybe 45 of us. Now, there is 160 of us, and we're moving up to 180. Yale is actually, uh, like many healthcare hospitals, uh, we've acquired another hospital from in, in the city, and we are now, I think, the ninth largest in the country. Now, down to said to, you are armed on duty, correct? Yes. Right, now, are all 160? Now, to go first of all, that expansion from 45 officers back in 2006 when you joined to 160 now, that underscores a lot of, I guess, of what the, the kind of behavior that's happening or the changes to culture that you might have seen in the past uh, 10 years. Um, but are all 160 uh, just to set the scene for people? Is, are all all those officers armed? Is it like a? I mean, that's yes. a true force. I mean, yes, uh, yeah, it's a large department, and uh, and we bring a lot of training experience. Yale really believes in uh, providing a safe environment for everybody that, from the employees to the patients to the visitors. It's a, we have eighteen thousand employees here, and oh my. Uh, and about ten thousand people that visit every day. So uh, <laughs> it's a little city within a small area. So we're pretty active. I see. Uh, so uh, it's it's uh, it's an interesting position. It was a, a very good position for for me uh, because coming from a city department where it's very active, now I'm able to really spend a lot of time on calls that I go on and truly help some people. Uh, every day at Yale. Uh, some people receive some of the worst, worst possible news imaginable, and some people receive some of the best news uh, that someone that they love and care for is going to get the, the finest treatment in the world. And uh, 
So we have some unique things that are happening in New Haven. Over the last 10 years, New Haven has been ranked uh, as one of the top 10 most violent cities in in the country. So, uh, and we've, as in the past five years, it's either one or two, and I think, or two or three, and usually Flint, Michigan is one. But, uh, but anyway, so we have, uh, we're an urban city hospital, and it has many of the issues that an urban environment, uh, provides us. So there's and a lot of- And you're, your expensive, your extensive experience in, in law enforcement has certainly made you very familiar with the population that you're dealing with right now. Yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, and it's a comfort comfort level. It, uh, and I really, really embrace it. I really enjoy it here, and uh, it's been a tremendous opportunity. And I understand you guys brought CPI training into Yale New Haven in 2008. And I'm wondering what you, your initial reaction to the training uh, was, or you could set that scene for well, us. Well, initially when I first arrived at Yale, every stretcher in the adult ED had hardwired leather restraints, every stretcher. I don't know if you could just imagine bringing, if you had to bring your, your grandmother or mother in and on the stretcher were leather restraints. So that, that kind of set a not the most welcoming appearance that we wanted. And we knew that we had to make improvements. So there was, like I said, we're all trained, experienced officers, and we realized that uh, the best skills are are the verbal skills and not the hands-on. So the hospital decided we needed to search out a nonviolent intervention company like CPI. And after an extensive search, they decided CPI, it's nationally recognized. Uh, we have a lot of regulatory agencies that come in here, and uh, as soon as they hear they were trained, CPI trained, uh, everybody feels very comfortable. Uh, it sets the standard. Uh, well, that was one part of it. The other part is the resources that we get from CPI, any kind of questions that I, I need to research or or find out, there's a whole cadre of people and resources that I can access. Uh, the other thing is, which was big to me, and that's why I became one of the instructors, was I really believe in assessing the situation rather than assuming what might be going on with a particular patient. I I really embrace the thought process that CPI embraces as well as continuing to assess what's what's occurring and always verbal de escalation. Right. Well I so this you mentioned in our pre pre interview that the verbal skills were emphasized and that hands on was always a last resort for you guys. Always a last resort. Uh you know, this is a People that are in this business know that it's not like TV. Uh, going hands-on uh, never is a, the best option. The best option is always when you can verbally de-escalate. Right. And so uh, becoming a, the NCI instructor in, in the beginning, we quickly realized that Yale's a very active place. And what we thought we'd do at that point was we would do Take the advanced practice training, and which we did rapidly. And at that point, we decided that medical people are very exact people, and we wanted to. I thought that we should all train together. Uh, if, you've, if you've ever seen medical people involved in a code, they all work wonderfully together. And so my thought process was: you respond how you're trained. Right. So what we decided to do here was protective services, adult ED, pediatric ED, adolescent uh, behavioral units, the adult behavioral units are the most active uh, units in the hospital, and we decided to all train together. 
NCI and then so that two, 2008 you guys did the initial NCI, correct? And then 2009, yes. 2009 you did advanced physical training. Yes. And then 2012 enhanced verbal. That this is, I think this is when you met uh, Dave Vargas, is that correct? I, I did. I uh, I went to San Antonio and uh, right away when when Dave introduced himself, I, there's something about uh, policemen we kind of connect. And uh, and Dave is a very dynamic uh, instructor, and he presents wonderfully. And we, both Dave and I, connected right away. We had a lot of common things uh, and experiences, and we shared some of them. And I was I was very honored, and uh, it was a great course. I firmly believe in the, in the verbal ha- enhancement and. Dave was one of – it was a perfect fit for him. So uh, Dave, he became you're, friendly. You're, excuse me. Sorry, Doug. Yep. That's all right. You guys became friendly. And um, yeah. Dave, what do, I mean, Dave, what do you remember about the training? Oh, well, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you, Terry, and thank you, Don, for those those kind of comments. Absolutely. I mean, we, you know, thinking back to that, that, that training program – I mean, um, that right there was the Enhancing Verbal Skills Applications Life Space Crisis Intervention Program. And um, in order to go to that program, of course, you, you need to be a, a, you know, or you need to be a certified instructor. And, and um, we had a, a wide range of instructors as far as, uh, as far as years of experience in that room. And as Don mentioned, I mean, right away we kind of connected re- regarding our backgrounds in law enforcement. And what really impressed me was that, I mean, not only just the fact that here's Don coming in from from Yale, New Haven, from Connecticut, and he's in San Antonio, which, I mean, anytime you see that on a roster where a person's coming in from such a long distance just for this program, that right there, I mean, you know, it, it just, it, it really makes you feel good. But on top of that, that because of our backgrounds in law enforcement, you know, and, and, and down coming to uh, the enhancing verbal skills. Now, oftentimes when I've met other law enforcement officers, it's always been, uh, you know, focusing on, you know, you know, just kind of battle stories about, you know, how things, how things have been, what, what they've seen. But, you know, when it, when, when really speaking with Don, I, I truly saw that he believed in our content. He really believed in the philosophy and the values of care, welfare, safety, and security. And really responding thoughtfully as opposed to reacting emotionally. And I thought this was an excellent, it was excellent that he came this way for enhancing verbal skills as opposed to maybe one of our, you know, the applied physical training or, um, or really any of the other courses and focusing maybe on more physical interventions, it really speaks volumes to you, not just down, but also to Yale New Haven about what their philosophy is in responding to individuals in crisis, individuals in need. Crisis behavior is need behavior, and especially in the healthcare setting, especially um, in, 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 a, in a service profession, you know, it really, and especially even speaking about Yale New Haven being one of the largest hospitals um, that they're dedicated to saying, you know, we want to be the best there is. We want people to, when they hear that we're being taken to Yale New Haven or I'm going to choose to go to Yale New Haven, I want to go to Yale New Haven. And and that goes back to the service that you provide and the commitment demonstrated just by Yale New Haven being, being willing to send down to our class. And we were there. I mean, I believe that was actually um, a, a sponsored on-site program with a um, metro area um, school district in San Antonio. Yeah. So there, uh, there was a large amount of educators in the room, um, and 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 uh, along with, of course, some healthcare and some security. And so it was a real nice. It was a fairly decent sized class. I'd say somewhere in between 15 and 20 participants. And but the collaboration and saying, you know what, you might see certain people on these days. We see certain people on these days, and and we all see very similar behaviors. But we all want the same result. We want people to feel comfortable, mm-hmm. be respected, and and so uh, like I said, as as Don and I connected over that three day training, um, we definitely stayed in contact even after that time. Uh, Don being even so kind as to um, to to. to, to 
to work with CPI and coordinated a on-site program at Yale New Haven that I instructed, I believe, about about a year and a half ago. I, I yeah. want to say I'm not entirely sure on that one. The time flies when you're a GPI. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 2014 time flies when you're a GPI. That's very good. Right, right. I mean, three cities a month. I mean, that, that's it's kind of – I can't believe I've already been with CPI for five years. So. Right. Well, I mean, and what a demonstration of commitment by New Haven, indeed, to send a Don to San Antonio for uh, enhanced verbal skills. That is – that's truly – those are true believers in the CPI uh, method and models, no doubt. Um, Don, you, you, you write that the thought process of the organization has changed after training. Could you talk about those changes, both internally, the sense of staff attitudes, and uh, externally? Um, I mean, you mentioned the the, uh, the AED stretchers with the with the hard wired restraints on them, but uh, if you if you could go with that a little bit, and, and uh, Dave, thank you for your uh, painting that picture of San Antonio so so clearly. Uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, Yale at that particular time said, okay, we we need to take the uh, these restraints off, uh, and the idea was after we initiated this training that we are going to work on our verbal skills, and even though it might take a little bit longer, the results are better. And we know now that there's a lot of – anytime you apply physical restraints, there's there could be bad results. There could be – something's going to happen, and we need to be concerned about it. And so by using our verbal skills, uh, it, it's just been such a positive thing. So I wanted – I wanted us all to work together and uh, use all our skills together. So we started responding as a group. Uh, in the police department, we've always had nonverbal communication. Uh, some departments use hand signals on where we stand. I added to our program a two and a four finger system where if you came around the corner and someone was having an inter interaction with someone, uh, you would know quickly uh, by using the two or the four fingers uh, where that person was and what his intentions were and how we should prepare and how we're, we could work as a team. And it's worked so well because before someone would have to take the time out and say, uh, all right, someone get the meds, someone get this, someone get that. We start initiating the team right away, right from the beginning because we recognize a nice, a good, coordinated team effort usually has a better result, a safer result. And uh, it's, it's, we've had very positive uh, results with this. Almost immediately with the mindset of let's use in our verbal skills, uh, the adolescent psych, which uh, we call Winnie One, experienced half, at least half uh, the restraint application. So that was very noticeable. Uh, the adult ED, the you mean you, you mean you decreased you decrease the need for restraints by half yes, the training? Yes, we did. Wow, that... uh, we reduced the, the application by half. Uh, so that was that was immediate and it was very recognizable, and it was a very positive. Was it, uh, that, that was an incredible result. Yeah. yeah. How long did that we, take? Well, we started recognizing it immediately. Uh, we had a the initial group of CPI instructors. We were so engaged, uh, the communication was amazing. So we were just feeding off all these great stories, and uh, which occur daily because we have so many so many times that we have to use this per day. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you know, when you yesterday in our pre if you, you do about ten of these per shift, or ten you debrief ten incidents per shift. That's yes. And, yeah, it is. Uh, it's a very active hospital. Uh, we have there's a, a tremendous amount of. Uh, we really need this program, and we have done so well with it. Having the team concept is uh, so important. And here's the other thing that we use from the beginning. We we recognize that there's there were nurses, medical people that were using terminology that wasn't the same as CPI, and we thought we need to have a common terminology. 
Mm-hmm. For example, uh, and we do this at every new class. We always ask, has anybody ever charted a patient was combative? And you always get a handful. And what we say is, from this point on, instead of using combative because it's suggestive, what's com- what combative means to one person might mean another thing completely different to another. We use AOP, acting out person. And this common terminology, it's evidence-based. So if something was to end up in litigation, when we went to the court, we would, we would be able to say, listen, we're CTI trained, uh, and acting out person is a certain level in the, in the continuum. And this is what it is, and it's evidence-based. It presents a more professional uh, court appearance. It's more educated, and we have everybody on the same page. Uh, right. From the moment a patient comes in, this uh, we use this, and all the way through until the patient's discharge, we use this common terminology. Uh, same thing with, when we do have an interaction, we redirect people. Uh, it's a it, when they call us on the radio. They'll, instead of saying, "Well, someone's uh, yelling over in this particular area," we'll say, "We need uh, we need a team over here to do a redirection." And it, it's it's a much calmer. If anybody hears the radio, it's uh, everybody understands what we're going to be doing. We're going to be applying our verbal de-escalation skills, and we activate the team. So it, it's it's been very successful. That's great. And you saw you saw you you saw fifty percent reduction in adolescent. How about in adult? You were I think I, I cut you off a little bit when you were about to remark on that. I don't have the exact numbers on right. on on uh, the adult side, but I would say easily from half to two thirds uh, reduction in restraints. Uh, there was a there was a culture years years ago where uh, someone came into the adult ED, they would. Uh, if the, the police department brought them in and they were they were acting out out on the street, they transitioned almost immediately into uh, two or four point restraints, mm-hmm. and that's that's not the process. The, the process now is when they arrive. Uh, that's whatever happened out on the street. That's one thing. What happens here is a little different. We're constantly assessing and uh, and trying to de-escalate. So. I, I love- I like your team approach, especially something you said yesterday. You said uh, people under crisis respond as they are trained, and you can see that team approach really having a collective power uh, when a behavioral situation presents. Absolutely. Uh, everybody just from the from the concept of teaching people the support of fans, and we when we teach that, it's a, it's a nice, comfortable way to approach, it, and it puts your mind automatically, okay, I'm protecting myself, it's supportive, and uh, we work as a team. And it, it puts your mindset in the right place. And uh, it's, a, it's a perfect way for us. We, we've just been, it's worked out so well. It's been uh, such a positive thing. And uh, like I said, this everybody's been very happy. It was, I thought it would, might be a tough, thing because teaching some of the protective services staff members, we all came from the police department, we're all older, so there was a different mindset. Yeah, I have Uh, that question here of some of the unique challenges of teaching law enforcement professional CPI models and techniques. Well, what I did was I I really, I broke it down, and uh, once we really looked at it, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the way we respond some of the uh the things if it does go to physical that we that we can apply are exactly how they they taught at the at the post academy and so it it really was it was it turned out to be an easier sell than I thought I'd have and like i said we most of us come with a lot of years of experience and uh it's a much it's much more gratifying when you de escalate someone with verbal skills. Um, before we started the interview today, I, I, I was sharing with you just last night, 
uh, the police department had a young individual that was out on the street. He fought with two or three policemen. Physical. He was uh, he was very aggravated. He was very anxious. Uh, he was very physical with the policemen, and he was brought to our uh, pediatric ED. And they, but he's a, he's a big guy. He was uh, he's about six foot two and good size. He's very angry, and uh, there was a lot of anxious staff members. But after continuing our our CPI, we recognized that he was anxious. We kept on you working with our verbal de-escalation skills. It, this is not an easy process sometimes. It actually took a few hours. Uh, but three hours into this, he calmly walked over to get further treatment. There was no hands-on physical interaction. Man. We de-escalated, and he got the treatment that he needed. So it was a very positive result, and uh, everybody was safe. And that's that's the most that's very gratifying, and that's that's what I'm most proud of. Excellent, excellent. Dave, may I ask you have you have you had unique challenges teaching law enforcement professionals over other uh, staff that you might train in CPI techniques? Um, as a matter of fact, you know, I think back to the days when I started five years ago, and of course, just being um, relatively new. I mean, the the organization. I, I remember even my my first annual review um, at CPI. I, I was I was told by my director and my manager that yeah, out of anyone we hired this year, you were the one who we had the most concern about. I said, boy, that I thought to myself, that's really good to hear, right? Uh, <laughs> and uh, they actually turned out. Yeah, they they followed up with that, saying actually the reason for that is because you came from a squad car and we put you in front of a group of forty people, or a group of twenty people, and we said they said we couldn't be more happier with your progress, and to me that was really, um, you know, that was really a vote of confidence in me, and especially because it, I was still wrapping my mind around all of the different concepts and how we can apply all of our our different training models into real life uh, situations and scenarios. And so back then, I think just as, as probably many, sometimes many of, many of the GPIs and just many instructors in general, if they have to train someone who has a law enforcement um, or uh, military type background um, where, where they come from a very rigid kind of sometimes thought process of how to respond because of their previous experiences and previous training, it, it's sometimes daunting to, to train those individuals and, um, you know, I, I, at first, of course, I had that same hesitation. However, I then realized, wait a second, these are my people. These are the people who I've been with. I've stood on the line with. We have very similar backgrounds and experiences. And, you know, now I've embraced that, you know, if I'm able to go to a correctional setting, if I'm able to go to and train security or law enforcement, I, I mean, I am more than happy to go. I will volunteer right away um, because I feel like I can make that connection. I can say this is where it fits in to to our background, to, to persons with our same experiences, and that, you know what, though we're learning a different approach, you know, every all those other options we have, those still are in line. Those still We're still able to use that. The, the use of force continuum still is in play. However, it, I think that when most persons, when most police officers are trained, when they go to the police academy, that uh, they train officers to take the enforcement action. It takes a few years of being of experience and being more, more veteran officers, and maybe some it takes a little a few a few more years than than others to realize that really it's not about taking the, just about enforcement action, it's about taking that corrective action. How can we help the individual? And I'd much rather use, take a little bit of time now and use my verbal skills than go in, go in basically ready to uh, take physical action. I mean, I certainly do not wake up in the morning to, 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 to go to work um, and especially as a police officer, even when I was working full time as a police officer, I don't want to go to work to throw down. I don't want. I don't look right. forward to that. I want to go home safe. 
and my right. my yes, go home safe every day. And I want my people who are in my charge, whether they're my colleagues, whether they're the citizens of my community, or or whether it's our guests and uh, customers and our patients at our medical facility. I want them to go home safe. And so I have to decide how is my approach going to be, and I have to maybe vary my approach. And so helping staff members, and I, I love during the week of training when you just see um, you see kind of the change of the mindset from just being maybe a, you know, maybe, oh, this stuff is all kind of lovey-dovey. Oh, this is, this is, this is great, but it's not going to work. But when they start realizing, wait a second, if I just put a little bit more effort in, if I actually take my time and think about the words that I say, think about my nonverbal presentation then, and how much of an impact just those first initial pieces can make, it might save me a whole lot of time later on with having to deal with you know, someone who's physically agitated, with having to maybe potentially, um, you know, deal with a a plethora of reports to to write because of the action that I took. And and quite frankly, it might save me from having to go and seek out medical assistance for either myself, a colleague, or especially that person in crisis. Um, You know, it's benefits. Multiple yeah, so many numbers. And so well, I, I think. Go ahead, Chris. No, no, damn, I'm sorry. Um, I can see. I can see that based on you know just listening to how uh, Dan described all of the, the the culture change and the implementation um, at Yale New Haven. I mean, in, when I think about what what is our training goals through this program to help staff to organize their thinking to provide a common language to staff members that's consistent so that when they respond. Um, that they are very familiar with our crisis development model, very familiar with our verbal escalation continuum, and understanding that even though something has been tried once and I'm responding, I might want to try that same way again because it's a different approach from hearing it from a different person. Um, and that builds staff confidence in responding. And so, therefore, they have that increased, uh, their increased ability to problem solve during during uh, no matter what types of situations come in, and that contributes to co- that culture of care, welfare, safety, and security. I've always liked to say if we can provide good care and welfare up front, we increase our safety and security from then on out. And so it really comes back to just those first moments. And so when I, when I train persons from law enforcement, corrections, and security, and you know, they realize that, wow, I have more tools than just my muscle or more tools than just what, what's around my belt. Or, you know, and if they use their relationship as opposed to their authority, you know, I could see that they, they're like, finally I have something more and I, I feel like I'm even more confident and I can prepare my staff members um, to respond effectively to whatever situation in my life. I start to see how you have such a deep and productive association with Don, I mean, with the philosophy that you shared in your training with Don and then hearing how Don has turned around and, in fact, trained and brought that those values and those methods into Yale New Haven. Uh, a very dramatic uh, success uh, and uh, the way that this model can be replicated and succeed in different I- environments. Uh, and for someone like Don to go in and then to – uh, like you said uh, about the uh, the team effort that you invented that nonverbal verbal signal done uh, the, the, for your, your your team response um, with your fingers. Could you describe that a little more in a little more detail? Well, what we were what I was seeing when I first got here was medical people are very exact, and and part of being exact is they would verbalize right in front of the person that we're trying to have the interaction with what what our their intentions were uh and what preparations they were gonna do. So the the time that comes to that I most recognize that we needed to improve on this was I was trying to de escalate someone in the uh, psych hospital and behind me I could hear a nurse telling the other staff to get the restraints and who was going to have the left arm, who was going to have the right arm, oh, et cetera. Wow. And, I'm, and I'm thinking, I can hear you. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, so uh, that 
that impressed me that I, I said, listen, for years on the police department, we had a code system, a, a, a hand signal system that was very nonchalant, and you would know the other officer arriving, what, what direction they were going in. So I decided that a uh, two and a four finger system would be fine. We don't use one finger because people point. So uh, if someone just calmly puts out two fingers, then that means that let's start getting ready, uh, start preparing and activate the team. I need another couple people here uh, to support what I'm doing verbally. Uh, maybe get the, the uh, physical restraints over on the side, someone clean the room, uh, someone speak to a doctor about possible meds. It just activates a, a whole – so we're preempting the uh, – and sometimes situation. you'll actually you'll bring in someone who has had a prior rapport with the patient uh, sometimes. Absolutely. Well. What Part of this team effect is uh, that we have social workers, chaplains, and uh, officers, nurse, nurses involved. And when we activate this team, usually more times than not, there might be a, a past history and someone will be able to take the lead that has a, a good rapport. Also, we also know from our our training experience and mostly from experience that uh, some days the, a person might like you one day and the next not really care to talk to you where someone else coming around all suddenly will be able to engage and take the lead. So we're, we're comfortable with the handoff and uh, it's because the most important thing is people's egos need to be put on a shelf and the most, and then, and the, the best thing is a nice, safe uh, de-escalation. And so once we got past that, that culture or thought process of, no, I'm in charge, no, let's have what we really need is a, a safe conclusion. And so this team effort really has worked quite well. Uh, so, and, and we also use this, there's a forefinger, like a wave off, uh, which means that you can just stand by, stand around the corner. You can be ready, but uh, I've dealt with this person before, and if we overcrowd the situation, it could be just as detrimental. So uh, it, it's been very positive. Everybody uses it. Uh, actually, some of the nurses have used it for other uh, things when rather than yelling out if there's a, a code that's about to happen, uh, they've used the two and the four fingers to get help. So... Uh, it's been very positive here at Yale, mm-hmm. and uh, it's it's just been a wonderful process. Now the yeah, other you, thing that oh, go ahead. No, no, please. Well, uh, one of the the other thing that we that we introduced here is after e- each interaction, we we debrief mm-hmm. because we need to learn. Are we if, did we do something? How can we can we do it better? Did something just occur? And it's, it's an open debriefing with the staff. How do you feel what just occurred? Uh, and we discuss, discuss it openly. We, we have like a checklist. We also have a staff member that is dedicated to actually speaking to the, the, uh, patient or the visitor and their perception of what just occurred. And by reviewing this whole process, we've gotten better at it. And, uh, it's just it's a positive result, and this is something that CPI we use the coping model because we realize mm-hmm. that what affects the patient also affects the staff. Excellent. And so you, and Jerry, if I may, but please, please do. Um, yeah, and, and uh, just something to mention there, and, and I'm I'm really happy Don brought that up because it, you know we spend in in the advanced global skills course, you know we spend about a day and a half on the coping model on expanding on the, the thought process and the benefits that let's embrace crisis as an opportunity for learning growth and change and as opposed to, you know, okay, it's done, it's over with, let's all get back to work. Just in my experience um, with training with different organizations and hearing about implementation success stories, the two pieces that I really hear predominantly that, that, that what have organizations done to really implement and what it has, how has it affected their, their positive culture change? You know, the two pieces that really have, have, I've heard a lot of is exactly what Don just mentioned. That after even smaller incidents, smaller issues, they take the time 
to debrief and learn from that experience. And that right there, I try to communicate that and advocate that every week when I train a new group of certified instructors. And I try to say, you know, if you want positive success, take some time now and really spend, you know, even if it's five minutes, even if, especially for even if it's just a low level anxiety or you know defensive type behavior, take some time and debrief and just say, everybody good, what happened? How can we learn from this event? Because where I've heard that success is, hey, we learn from the event, we we find out what exactly happened, but we decide, hey, what did we do well? What could we do differently? And then as staff, we learn from that, and now let's even practice some of that through scenarios, scenario-based training. And that's something I'm sure, uh, you know, Don and I both under, have that understanding being from law enforcement. We do so many scenarios, scenarios, scenarios. And to the point where even when I was got, got done with the police academy, I mean, I was just scenarioed out. I really so, did so understand. For some of us who aren't, who haven't been exposed to the law enforcement culture, a scenario would be, I think I have a general idea, but it might be wrong. What, what exactly is that in police training? So when it comes to police training, basically we're going to take a situation that would, uh, that would possibly occur. And we are going to now place um, maybe one of our fellow officers as the uh, kind of as a role of a person in crisis or a role as a, as a citizen in the community. Maybe if it's going to be a domestic violence type call, and we're going to role play. basically it, it is a role play, but really more live action. And we are going to run this role play to see it through. And so scenario based training, um, we're going to take a ver- so varied situations. I mean, I think about back in the academy we did. Um, domestic violence, we did active shooter, we did um, just even, even simple calls on a, on a regular basis. We would go through these different types of scenarios to prepare us for what's to come. I mean, even scenarios to where we may have to use our sidearm, our firearm, um, our weapon, and potentially um, subdue a potential threat. And so the same idea is can be utilized even even with our training as far as uh, with CPI. In, in Unit 6 of our of our nonviolent crisis intervention course, we expand on the idea of staff fear and anxiety and co- what contributes to that and understanding that we all have fear and anxiety. We can never get rid of that fear and anxiety. And I realized finally something clicked that, you know what, scenario-based training is where it's at. We can do all we want about talking about what can we do differently next time, let's do that next time, but really provide staff members to build staff confidence. Let's actually role-play that. Let's actually get ourselves into the moment as opposed to saying, what would you do? No, let's actually do it ourselves. I'll be the person in crisis. You be the, the officer or you be the staff member who's responding. Let's go and, I mean, really let's, I mean, get into the moment almost. You know, sometimes what I say to my classes is, that, you know, put on some Oscar-nominated shoes right now and really get into the moment um, because that's what's going to prepare us because we're in a safe training environment. If we can prepare ourselves now, you know, we're taking what we train and we're going to then apply it in, the, in, in real life if that situation were to occur. And I, that's one thing I really advocate is let's take the moment to – to, to look at the debriefing process, to say, what did we do well? What can we do differently? If we're going to do this differently, let's practice doing it differently, and let's run a, a quick scenario um, of what that would look like. That's honestly where I've heard the most success from organizations who have, who have implemented CPI, that that's, that's, where they, that's some of the commonalities that I've – some of the top two commonalities I've probably heard is they really embrace that opportunity – and learn from experiences. And hopefully we can help staff members who may not have been through that experience to prepare themselves. And it goes back to that law enforcement training that, you know what, I think about all that different training I went through and why did why did we go through so many scenarios? It was so that when we respond, that we respond more effectively, that it's not, we, we don't have that shock value. Because a law enforcement officers, every one of us has fear and anxiety. But it's the idea that if we train ourselves to respond in an effective manner, you know what, we can keep our anxiety and our emotions in control. We can actually um, respond in a way that will help the individual and that's going to, again, decrease or uh, hopefully you know, it w- we'll respond in a way that's going to effectively um, excuse me, uh, help the individual and also keep us safe. 
Absolutely. Don, you know, something that, that, that resonates with a quote that Don uh, said to me yesterday, quote, people under crisis respond as they are trained. And you can see through that regular debriefing and also through those scenarios that that repetition helps people to internalize their response and to recognize that their responses of their team members as well in the moment. Absolutely. And, you know, actually, this is kind of a funny little note, but when, when we teach this class, uh, because people do, it's, and inherently you're going to be anxious uh, when you, you're involved in one of these situations, and sometimes people don't know what to say. So we, we paraphrase something right from CPI. So if you don't know what to say and you're nervous and you're trying to think and uh, you want to calm the situation, we always tell everybody to say in a very slow, low voice, I'm here to keep you safe. Uh. And uh, and so and we employ that as, you know, what do anxious people do? They, they speak fast, they talk loud, so you lower your voice and you're here to keep you safe. And so often it's uh, everybody kind of chuckled, and now they do. They really chuckle, but everybody knows I'm calming myself down. And uh, if anybody was to be listening, what would they hear our staff saying? The most important thing, we're here to keep them safe. Mm -hmm. I know. know, It's it's a great message. Yeah, absolutely. I understand that uh, there at, at uh, Yale New Haven, you are known as Mr. CPI. Yeah. Because uh, because we talked yesterday, I was gonna we were gonna talk maybe at then about who most inspired you, but you said, well, let's talk about. Uh, I want to talk about my legacy at Yale New Haven and, and and Mr. CPI. Could you speak to that a little bit for us to? Well, to as I today? officially uh, transitioned to probably the, the last few years of my career, hopefully. Uh, I've always said this is this is going to be one of my legacies. Be be in CPI of bringing this program here, keeping people safe, and they look forward to it. And I've been teaching so many people and presenting so many of the terminology to all the new employees when they first come, and they everybody says you're so passionate about this, and my answer is. I'm passionate because I believe in it, and I've seen it be successful. And so when I leave, I hope my legacy is that I did keep people safe here, and this program helped. So, uh, yeah, a lot of people come up to me and they go, there, hey, there's uh, Mr. CPI. He's the, the one that teaches the course. So, uh, And that's, that's, a, that's a great thing for me. And you had a quote yesterday, too, a uh, three-word thing about uh, – it worked again was something that you said. Yeah. Something that you say often about uh, CPA, CPI methods. Yeah, a lot of people will uh, stop me in the hallway and say, uh, Don, i got to tell you something. We used it today, and it worked again. And everybody was safe. And that is such a positive thing. It makes uh, I get goosebumps thinking about it because it wasn't always like that. <laughs> and uh, That's, this, that's this powerful. Approach. Yes, it is. And so I'm I'm grateful to to have been able to embrace this program and bring it to Yale. Uh, so I, I I have to thank you all. Don, we're, well, thank you, and we're grateful to you as well, Don. Dave, do you have any last thoughts for us today? Well, uh, like I said, I I think that you now that that speaks volumes. I mean, I I, I wish that uh, I, did, I wish that we were sitting here having a conversation face to face, Don. It'd be so great to catch up with you even more. But just hearing your your thoughts. <laughs> Uh, just hearing your thoughts and hearing just the, your positive outcomes, how 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 far you know Yale New Haven's come, and and how how much that it's it's going to continue on, and I I truly do believe it. It would be your uh, your legacy, and and just I, I know how passionate you are about this program, and how respected you are as, as when I visited um, Yale New Haven uh, a year and a half ago, um, and it's. Uh, it truly speaks volumes, and to me, I just have a big smile on my face as I'm as I'm hearing and, I can, and picturing some of your your colleagues and staff members walking up to you and saying, "Hey, let listen, it worked again." And I mean, just the power that hearing that and the validation that you get as a, as an instructor, um, I mean, it, it's 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 amazing. It really is. I, I I hope that every organization that implements CPI and every 
um, every facility, um, whatever the background might be, educational, health care, mental health, and most, most, most specifically security and law enforcement, I hope that they have those same results, that if we can truly implement this, you know what, it's, it's powerful, it works, it's not, it's not, it's not rocket science. It's something that we all can put into effect. And maybe it takes some of us, it, it comes easily. Sometimes it just takes a little bit more legwork. But if we really truly work at it, you know, we really can change the lives of those in our care. We can change the lives of the, the, the colleagues and employees that we work with. Um, and we really embrace that culture and, and perpetuate that culture of care, welfare, safety, and security. And that should be our goal, is to make the world a better place. And I, I can just see, you know, and as because I've been there, I've seen it, and but I can certainly hear it in, in Don's words that, I mean, he's made a very much lasting impact, and made, made, a, made a lot of people, made many customers, consumers, patients, visitors, staff members, uh, many persons' lives a lot better by his service. So I don't know if you want to get to down. That is a meaningful legacy indeed. Uh, well, my guests today have been Don Costa, Lieutenant and Manager of Protective Services at the Yale New Haven Hospital, and Dave Vargas. He's a lead global professional instructor with CPI. Gentlemen, my thanks to you both for an excellent interview. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, Terry. And Dave, it's nice hearing from you. We'll be in touch. Absolutely. Thank you, Terry, and, and thank you, Don. Yes, we've definitely got to get in touch one of these days. So let's, let's stay in touch. All right. All right.